सी आई ए टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास सेवेंथ इन टाइटल्ड आर पास टू दिस इज चैप्टर सिक्स टाउन्स ट्रेडर्स एंड क्राफ्ट पर्सन फ्रॉम पेज नंबर सेवेंटी फाइव टू पेज नंबर नाइंटी लेट्स लिसन टू चैप्टर नंबर सिक्स टाउन्स ट्रेडर्स and crafts persons page number 75 what would a traveler visiting a medieval town expect to find this would depend on what kind of a town it was a temple town an administrative center a commercial town or a port town to name just some possibilities in fact many towns combined several functions they were administrative centers temple towns as well as centers of commercial activities and craft production on this page a map is being shown map 1 some important centers of trade and artisanal production in central and south india the names mentioned in this map of these centers are kabul वृंदावन पुष्कर अजमेर अहमदाबाद मुर्शिदाबाद कैलकटा सोमनाथ सूरत बिरार बॉम्बे बिदर बीजापुर गोलकुंडा हम्पी कमलापुरम मसूली पटनम स्वामी मलाई तिरुपति मेड्रास महाबलीपुरम तिरुवन्ना मलाई तंजावूर उराइयूर मदुराई पेज नंबर सेवेंटी सिक्स एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव सेंटर्स You read about the Chola dynasty in chapter 2. Let's travel in our imagination to Tanjavur, the capital of the Cholas, as it was a thousand years ago. The perennial river Kaveri flows near this beautiful town. One hears the bells of the Raj Rajeshwar temple built by the king Raj Raja Chol. The town's people are all praised for its architect Kunjar Mallan Raj Raj Peru Thachan, who has proudly carved his name on the temple wall, inside is a massive shivaling. Besides the temple, there are palaces with mandaps or pavilions. Kings hold court in these mandaps, issuing orders to their subordinates. There are also barracks for the army. The town is bustling with markets selling grain, spices, cloth. and jewelry water supply for the town comes from wells and tanks the saliye weavers of tanjavur and the nearby town of urayur are busy producing cloth for flags to be used in the temple festival fine cottons for the king and nobility and coarse cotton for the masses some distance away at swami malai The sthapatis or sculptors are making exquisite bronze idols and tall ornamental bell metal lamps. Temple towns and pilgrimage centers. Tanjavur is also an example of a temple town. Temple towns represent a very important pattern of urbanization, the process by which cities develop. Temples were often central to the economy and society. Rulers built temples to demonstrate their devotion to various deities. They also endowed temples with grants of land and money to carry out elaborate rituals, feed pilgrims and priests and celebrate festivals. Pilgrims who flocked to the temples also made donations. On the left-hand side of this page, a question is being asked. Why do you think people regarded tanjavur as a great town page 
On the top of this page, some important information is provided regarding bronze, bell metal and lost wax technique. In a pink box, bronze, bell metal and the lost wax technique. Bronze is an alloy containing copper and tin. Bell metal contains a greater proportion of tin than other kinds of bronze. This produces a bell-like sound. Chola bronze statues, see chapter 2, were made using the lost wax technique. First, an image was made of wax. This was covered with clay and allowed to dry. Next, it was heated and a tiny hole was made in the clay cover. The molten wax was drained out through this hole. Then molten metal was poured into the clay mold through the hole. Once the metal cooled and solidified, the clay cover was carefully removed and the image was cleaned and polished. What do you think were the advantages of using this technique? On the right-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 1 A bronze statue of Krishna subduing the serpent demon, Kaliya. Temple authorities used their wealth to finance trade and banking. Gradually, a large number of priests, workers, artisans, traders, etc. settled near the temple to cater to its needs and those of the pilgrims. Thus grew temple towns. Towns emerged around temples, such as those of Billaswamin, Bhilsa or Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh and Somnath in Gujarat. Other important temple towns included Kanchipuram and Madurai in Tamil Nadu and Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh. Pilgrimage centers also slowly developed into townships, Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh and Tiruvannamalai in Tamil Nadu are examples of two such towns. Ajmer in Rajasthan was the capital of the Chauhan kings in the 12th century and later became the Suba headquarters under the Mughals. It provides an excellent example of religious coexistence. Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti, the celebrated Sufi saint, see also chapter 8, who settled there in the 12th century, attracted devotees from all creeds. Near Ajmer is a lake, Pushkar, which has attracted pilgrims from ancient times. Page 78 A Network of Small Towns From the 8th century onwards, the subcontinent was dotted with several small towns. These probably emerged from large villages. They usually had a mandapika, or mandi of later times, to which nearby villagers brought their produce to sell. They also had market streets called hut, or heart of later times, lined with shops. Besides, there were streets for different kinds of artisans, such as potters, oil pressers, sugar makers, toddy makers, smiths, stone masons, etc., while some traders lived in the town. Others travelled from town to town. Many came from far and near to these towns to buy local articles and sell products of distant places like horses, salt, camphor, saffron, betel nut and spices like pepper. On the left top of this page, a question is being asked in a blue box. Make a list of towns in your district and try to classify these as administrative centers or as temple or pilgrim centers. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 2. A city market. In this picture, people of different backgrounds wearing different kinds of clothes are seen in a marketplace. Page 79 Usually a Samant or in later times a Zamindar built a fortified palace in or near these towns. They levied taxes on traders, artisans and articles of trade and sometimes donated 
the right to collect these taxes to local temples, which had been built by themselves or by rich merchants. These rites were recorded in inscriptions that have survived to this day. On the top right of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 3. A Wood Carver Taxes on Markets The following is a summary from a 10th century inscription from Rajasthan, which lists the dues that were to be collected by temple authorities. There were taxes in kind on sugar and jaggery, dyes, thread and cotton, on coconuts, salt, arica nuts, butter, sesame oil, on cloth. Besides, there were taxes on traders, on those who sold metal goods, on distillers, on oil, on cattle fodder and on loads of grain. Some of these taxes were collected in kind, while others were collected in cash. Find out more about present-day taxes on markets, who collects these, and how are they collected, and what are they used for? Traders, big and small. There were many kinds of traders. These included the Banjaras. See also Chapter 7. Several traders, especially horse traders, formed associations with headmen who negotiated on their behalf with warriors who bought horses. Since traders had to pass through many kingdoms and forests, they usually travelled in caravans and formed guilds to protect their interests. There were several such guilds in South India from the 8th century onwards, the most famous being the Mani Gramam and Nana Desi. These guilds traded extensively both within the peninsula and with Southeast Asia and China. There were also communities like the Chettiars and the Marwadi Oswal who went on to become the principal trading groups of the country. Gujarati traders, including the communities of Hindu Baniyas and Muslim Bohras, traded extensively with the ports of Red Sea, Persian Gulf, East Africa, Southeast Asia and China. They sold textiles and spices in these ports and in exchange brought gold and ivory from Africa and spices, tin, Chinese blue pottery and silver from Southeast Asia and China. The towns on the west coast were home to Arab, Persian, Chinese, Jewish and Syrian Christian traders. Indian spices and cloth sold in the Red Sea ports were purchased by Italian traders and eventually reached European markets, fetching very high profits. Spices grown in tropical climates, pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, dried ginger, etc. became an important part of European cooking and cotton cloth was very attractive. This eventually drew European traders to India. We will shortly read about how this changed the face of trading and towns. On the left-hand side of this page, a question is being asked, written in a blue box. As you can see, during this period, there was a great circulation of people and goods. What impact do you think this would have had on the lives of people in towns and villages? Make a list of artisans living in towns. On the bottom of this page, important information is shared regarding the city, Kabul, in a blue box. Kabul With its rugged, mountainous landscape, Kabul, in present-day Afghanistan, became politically and commercially important from the 16th century onwards. Kabul and Kandhar were linked to the celebrated Silk Route. Besides, trade in horses was primarily carried on through this route. In the 17th century, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, a diamond merchant, estimated that the horse trade at Kabul amounted to rupees 30,000 annually, which was a huge sum in those days. Camels carried dried fruits, dates, 
carpets, silks and even fresh fruits from Kabul to the subcontinent and elsewhere. Slaves were also bought here for sale. Page 81 Crafts in Towns The craftspersons of Bidar were so famed for their inlay work in copper and silver that it came to be called Bidri. The Panchals or Vishwakarma community, consisting of goldsmiths, bronze smiths, blacksmiths, masons and carpenters, were essential to the building of temples. They also played an important role in the construction of palaces, big buildings, tanks and reservoirs. Similarly, weavers such as Saliar or Kekkolas emerged as prosperous communities, making donations to temples. Some aspects of cloth making like cotton cleaning, spinning and dyeing became specialized and independent crafts. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 4 A Shawl Border On the right-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 5 A 17th century candle stand, brass with black overlay. Page 82 On the top of this page, Important information is given regarding Ahmedabad in Gujarat in a pink box. The Changing Fortunes of Towns Some towns like Ahmedabad, Gujarat went on to become major commercial cities, but others like Tanjavur shrank in size and importance over the centuries. Murshidabad in West Bengal on the banks of the Bhagirathi, which rose to prominence as a center for silks, and became the capital of Bengal in 1704, declined in the course of the century as the weavers faced competition from cheap mill-made cloth from England. A closer look, Hampi, Masuli Patnam and Surat. The Architectural Splendor of Hampi Hampi is located in the Krishna Tungabhadra Basin, which formed the nucleus of Vijayanagar Empire, founded in 1336. The magnificent ruins at Hampi reveal a well-fortified city. No mortar or cementing agent was used in the construction of these walls, and the technique followed was to wedge them together by interlocking. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 6. A view of the watchtower through a broken ball of the enclosure of Hampi. Page 83 A fortified city. This is how a Portuguese traveller, Domingo Pes, described Hampi in the 16th century. At the entrance of the gate were those pass who come from Goa. This king has made within it a very strong city fortified with walls and towers. These walls are not like those of other cities, but are made of very strong masonry, such as would be found in few other parts, and inside very beautiful rows of buildings made after their manner with flat roofs. Why do you think the city was fortified? On the right-hand top of this page, important information is given regarding the water system in Vijayanagar Empire. During their rule, the Vijayanagar rulers took keen interest in building tanks and canals. The Anantaraj Sagar tank was built with a 1.37 km long earthen dam across the Maldevi River. Krishnadev Rai built a huge stone embankment between two hills to create a massive lake near Vijayanagar from which water was carried through aqueducts and channels to irrigate fields and gardens. The architecture of Hampi was distinctive. The buildings in the royal complex had splendid arches, domes and pillared halls with niches for holding sculptors. They also had well-planned orchards and pleasure gardens with sculptural motives such as the lotus and corbels. In its heyday in the 15th-16th centuries, Hampi bustled with commercial and cultural activities. Muslim merchants, 
chitties and agents of European traders such as the Portuguese thronged the markets of Hampi. Temples were the hub of cultural activities and Devadasis or temple dancers performed before the deity, royalty and masses in the many pillared halls in the Virupaksha temple, a form of Shiva. The Mahanavmi festival known today as Navratri in the south was one of the most important festivals celebrated at Hampi. On the right-hand bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 7 Stone Chariot Vithal Temple, Hampi Page 84 Archaeologists have found the Mahanavmi platform where the king received guests and accepted tribute from subordinate chiefs. From here, he also watched dance and music performances as well as wrestling bouts. Hampi fell into ruin following the defeat of Vijayanagar in 1565 by the Deccanese Sultans, the ruler of Golconda, Bijapur, Ahmednagar, Berar and Bidar. Page number 84 A gateway to the west, Surat. Surat in Gujarat was the emporium of western trade during the Mughal period along with Kambay, present-day Khambad, and somewhat later Ahmedabad. Surat was the gateway for trade with West Asia via the Gulf of Ormuz. Surat has also been called the gate to Mecca because many pilgrim ships set sail from here. The city was cosmopolitan and people of all castes and creeds lived there. In the 17th century, the Portuguese, Dutch and English had their factories and warehouses at Surat. According to the English chronicler Ovington, who wrote an account of the port in 1689, on average, a hundred ships of different countries could be found anchored at the port at any given time. There were also several retail and wholesale shops selling cotton textiles. The textiles of Surat were famous for their gold lace borders, or zari, and had a market in West Asia, Africa and Europe. The state built numerous rest houses to take care of the needs of people from all over the world who came to the city. There were magnificent buildings and innumerable pleasure parks. The Katiawar Sates or Mahajans or money changers had huge banking houses at Surat. It is noteworthy that the Surat Hundis were honoured in the far-off markets of Cairo in Egypt, Basra in Iraq and Antwerp in Belgium. On the left side of this page, two important informations are being shared. Emporium a place where goods from diverse production centers are bought and sold. Hundi is a note recording a deposit made by a person. The amount deposited can be claimed in another place by presenting the record of the deposit. However, Surat began to decline towards the end of the 17th century. This was because of many factors the loss of markets and productivity because of the decline of the Mughal Empire, control of the sea routes by the Portuguese and competition from Bombay, present-day Mumbai, where the English East India Company shifted its headquarters in 1668. Today, Surat is a bustling commercial centre. Page number 85 Fishing in Troubled Waters Masuli Pattanam The town of Masuli Pattanam or Machli Pattanam, literally fishport town, lay on the delta of Krishna River. In the 17th century, it was a centre of intense activity. Both the Dutch and English East India companies attempted to control Masuli Pattanam as it became the most important port on the Andhra coast. The fort at Masuli Pattanam was built by the Dutch. A poor fisher town. 
This is a description of Masuli Pattanam by William Methworld, a factor of the English East India Company in 1620. This is the chief port of Golconda, where the right worshipful East India Company have their agent. It is a small town but populous, unwalled, ill-built and worse situated. Within all the springs a brackish. It was first a poor fisher town. Afterwards, the convenience of the road, a place where ships can anchor, made it a residence for merchants and so continues since R and the Dutch nation frequented this coast. Why did the English and the Dutch decide to establish settlements in Masuli Pattanam? On the right-hand side of this page, an important information is shared. Factor Official in charge of trading activities of the European trading companies. The Khutub Shahi rulers of Golconda imposed royal monopolies on the sale of textiles, spices and other items to prevent the trade passing completely into the hands of the various East India companies. Fierce competition among various trading groups, the Golconda nobles, Persian merchants, Telugu Komati Chettis and European traders made the city populous and prosperous. As the Mughals began to extend their power to Golconda, their representative, the governor Mir Jumla, who was also a merchant, began to play off the Dutch and the English against each other. In 1686, to 1687, Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb annexed Golconda. This caused the European companies to look for alternatives. It was a part of the new policy of the English East India Company that it was not enough if a port had connections with the production centres of the hinterland. The new company trade centres, it was felt, should combine political, administrative and commercial roles. As the company traders moved to Bombay, Calcutta, present-day Kolkata and Madras, present-day Chennai, Masuli Pattanam lost both its merchants and prosperity and declined in the course of the 18th century, being today nothing more than a dilapidated little town. New Towns and Traders in the 16th and 17th centuries, European countries were searching for spices and textiles which had become popular both in Europe and West Asia. The English, Dutch and French formed East India Company in order to expand their commercial activities in the East. Initially, great Indian traders like Mullah Abdul Ghafoor and Virji Vora, who owned a large number of ships, competed with them. However, the European companies used their naval power to gain control of the sea trade and forced Indian traders to work as their agents. Ultimately, the English emerged as the most successful commercial and political power in the subcontinent. The spurt in demand for goods like textiles led to a great expansion of the crafts of spinning, weaving, bleaching, dyeing, etc., with more and more people taking them up. Page number 87 Indian textile designs became increasingly refined. However, this period also saw the decline of the independence of craftspersons. They now began to work on a system of advances which meant that they had to weave cloth which was already promised to European agents. Weavers no longer had the liberty of selling their own cloth or weaving their own patterns. They had to reproduce the designs supplied to them by the company agents. The 18th century saw the rise of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras, which are nodal cities today. Crafts and commerce underwent major changes as merchants and artisans such as weavers were moved into the black towns 
established by the European companies within these new cities. The blacks or native traders and craftspersons were confined here, while the white rulers occupied the superior residences of Fort St. George in Madras or Fort St. William in Calcutta. The story of crafts and commerce in the 18th century will be taken up next year. On the bottom of this page, a picture is shown. Figure 8. A Bombay Street. Early 19th century. Page 88. Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus. In the 15th century, European sailors undertook unprecedented explorations of sea routes. They were driven by the desire to find ways of reaching the Indian subcontinent and obtaining spices. Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese sailor, sailed down the African coast, went round the Cape of Good Hope and crossed over to the Indian Ocean. His first journey took more than a year. He reached Calicut in 1498 and returned to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, the following year. He lost two of his four ships and of the 170 men at the start of the journey, only 54 survived in spite of the obvious hazards. The routes that were opened up proved to be extremely profitable and he was followed by English, Dutch and French sailors. The search for sea routes to India had another unexpected fallout. On the assumption that the earth was round, Christopher Columbus, an Italian, decided to sail westwards across the Atlantic Ocean to find a route to India. He landed in the West Indies, which got their name because of his confusion, in 1492. He was followed by sailors and conquerors from Spain and Portugal who occupied large parts of Central and South America, often destroying earlier settlements in the area. On this page, a picture is being shown. Figure 9 This is the picture of Vasco da Gama. Imagine, you are planning a journey from Surat to West Asia in the 17th century. What are the arrangements you will make? Page 89 Let's recall. 1. Fill in the blanks. A. Raj Rajeshwar Temple was built in fill in the blank. B. Ajmer is associated with the Sufi saint fill in the blank. C. Hampi was the capital of the fill in the blank empire. D. The Dutch established a settlement at fill in the blank in Andhra Pradesh. 2. State whether true or false. A. We know the name of the architect of the Raj Rajeshwar temple from an inscription. B. Merchants preferred to travel individually rather than in caravans. C. Kabul was a major center for trade in elephants. D. Surat was an important trading port on the Bay of Bengal. 3. How was water supplied to the city of Tanjavur? 4. Who lived in the black towns in cities such as Madras? Keywords Temple towns Urbanization Vishwakarma Emporium Black town Page 90 Let's understand 5. Why do you think towns grew around temples? 6. How important were craftspersons for the building and maintenance of temples? 7. Why did people from distant lands visit Surat? 8. In what ways was craft production in cities like Calcutta different from that in cities like Tanjavur? Let's discuss. 9. Compare any one of the cities described in this chapter with a town or a village with which you are familiar. 
Do you notice any similarities or differences? 10. What were the problems encountered by merchants? Do you think some of these problems persist today? Let's do. 11. Find out more about the architecture of either Tanjavur or Hampi and prepare a scrapbook illustrating temples and other buildings from these cities. 12. Find out about any present-day pilgrimage centre. Why do you think people go there? What do they do there? Are there any shops in the area? If so, what is bought and sold there? The chapter 6 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator Babla Kuchar You were just listening to this audio book. Technical Control, Bati Langlingdo Technical Assistance, Vikas Sangwan Assistance in Production, Kusum Lata Direction and Production, Vimalesh Chaudhary This audio book is brought to you by CIET and CERT, New Delhi, India